today I'm going to talk about just a couple features um, that, that I've been really excited about. Um, and uh, yeah, I won't, I won't geek out too much, but hopefully just the right amount. So um, as most of you know, we provide weights and biases as a hosted web service. So we actually host our service on Google Cloud Platform, and that's where app.wnb.ai sits. But when we go out into um, kind of the corporate world and talk to potential uh, customers of our, of our software, it's often a requirement that they're able to, to run their own server or their own version of local. So over the last uh, year or two, as we built this company, we tried a number of different approaches to providing our service local. And we recently relaunched um, uh, WNB Local, which is now a part of our Python library. So if you do a pip install WNB, you'll have this. And behind the scenes, all it's doing is it's running Docker, um, and it's going to run our Docker container, WNB slash local, which contains our entire server and allows us to run a fully featured um, weights and biases service um, on our own machine in our own private network. So I'm going to go ahead and just do that live now. Um, and I'll also sneak in um, kind of a new feature that I'm excited about um, as well. So first, I'm in this directory, WNB um, demo. And I've got WNB installed, so I can just run WNB local. And I already have the Docker image pulled. If this were the first time I were running it, it would actually pull the, the latest image from Docker Hub. And now it actually launched me into the browser. And as this, uh, as this boots, we're going to see um, that we're actually loading the environment. So weights and bias is local. Um, and I'm seeing comments here. I will increase the, the text size. Um, weights and bias is local is actually running a number of services inside this Docker container. So we use MySQL to um, store metadata. And we use cloud storage to store all the artifacts associated with experiments. And we've actually launched our own um, instances of those services inside the Docker container. Um, so the first time I launch local, it's going to ask me to create an account. So now the, uh, the install can be secured. So I just created my account. And now it's giving me my API key. So I can go back to my terminal. And now it will log me into my local instance. So to show you the actual local instance in action, I'm going to go ahead and from this same directory start a JupyterLab instance. I'll make this a little bigger or too big. OK. So I'll fire up Jupyter Lab. Jupyter Lab, not Jupyter Lack. OK. Cool. So now I've got a demo notebook. Um, and inside this notebook, I just have a very simple neural network. So I'm pulling in Fashion in Mist, and I'm importing the WNB library. And I'm going to go ahead and load the data and normalize it. And then I've got a super simple um, convolutional neural net here that I'll compile. And then lastly, I'm going to init my WNB project and then use the weights and biases callback, specifying that I have images. So they'll automatically be logged with labels. And this should be good to go. So now you can see, because I actually installed local, my local system is configured to talk to localhost instead of um, app.wnb.ai. And uh, it's gone ahead and put it into my default entity, which is Van Pelt, that username that I created on signup. And now if I click here, I can actually see um, the run before I, I need to step through my new features here and my brand new install of local. And now we can see the, the same weights and biases local experience that um, most of you have, have seen before. But now instead of running inside of our Google Cloud servers, we're actually running directly on um, my laptop. So we can see that we're logging some examples from our fashion data set here. And all of our loss metrics are, are updating in real time. And uh, if I were to turn off my network right now, which I won't do because, of course, I would stop streaming to you all. All of this would continue to function because all communication is happening over localhost just on this machine. Um, just for fun, we can actually we can actually see what's going on inside of, of local here. So 
if I list all of the processes that are running on my system, we could see I've got one container named WMB slash local running on my system. And now I can actually shell into it. So I could say Docker, exec, IT, um, let's go into 719 and we'll run bash. So now I'm inside of local and we can see that we're actually running a number of services. So weights and biases itself is actually running my SQL and then Minio for a cloud um, file store, uh, as well as a number of our internal Go services that, that actually um, make all of the systems uh, work together. So one of the new features I wanted to share was better version control inside of, of Jupyter. So we just released a new version of our client, um, version 0834 uh, today, that has much better port, uh, much better support for, um, for Jupyter uh, versioning. So here, let's say I change my um, dense layer maybe to, to 64 and um, maybe reduce my convolution from 32 to 16. And then let's run for three epics this time as well. Now, if I redefine my model and I re-init and call my callback again, um, I can go to my runs and see now that I have two runs, Honest Win 1 and Resonance 2. If I jump into Honest Win 1, I can see the files that I've actually saved uh, with this instance. So here we can see things like our config, which will contain the number of epics as well as some metadata about my experiment. But if I go into the code, um, we'll see two, two new files here. So one is demo.ipy. Um, and this is really a sneak peek feature, guys. So this currently isn't available in the, in the cloud product, but we will be um, making it available in the next day or two. We now render Python notebooks. So we can see the exact kind of Python notebook that was run, but we also create this session history Python notebook. So what's happened here is behind the scenes, we actually tracked exactly which cells were run in your current session. And we can see the exact code um, as it was run. So here, this was run when I hadn't changed these, these values. So we can see epics five and dense 10. If I go to my other run, uh, which would be floral resonance, we'll see that this actually saved my entire history, including the cells that I ran when I actually changed the values. So now this can really be a great way to, to add a layer of version control on top of your notebook so that you can go back and see exactly what code you ran um, to produce any given experiment. Um, now I haven't done this yet, so this would be trying live and I'm, I'm worried this might break, but it wouldn't be a demo without potentially breaking. So we also have a code comparer panel and you know notebooks behind the scenes are actually storing JSON, but for our cases, we, we actually extract all of the code from the notebook and then can show you the actual lines of code from the notebook so that you could see the difference between two given runs. Um, and in this case, we're actually looking at the source code, which I hadn't saved. Um, so we're not gonna see a difference. If I had saved this, I think, and, and ran it again, um, we would. So with that, um, I am more than happy to take any questions folks have about um, WB Local or our new um, Jupyter Notebook support. Um, and yeah, one thing to know, someone was asking about Colab. One of the issues with Colab is we couldn't get the source notebook itself because it's actually not stored on the Colab instance, but now we will be able to actually store the session history. So all of the, the cells that you run within a, a Colab context will be exposed in that session.ipynd, and you could uh, use that for reproducibility or, or sharing down the road. So with that, I'll see you guys in the, uh, in the Slack room and uh, uh, really excited. To yeah, go ahead, Levine. I can ask you some of the questions they're asking in the Slack. Sure, let's do it. Cool. So someone asked, can the local instance be used completely offline after the container is pulled? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the only requirement is going to be wherever you're training your models, that needs to be able to talk to this container. So if you were running the container on the same machine, you could just talk to it over localhost. But most of our customers run the container inside of, say, a Kubernetes cluster on Amazon ECS. Um, but you could do that on a private uh, VPC network so that you would never have any, any data go out on the internet. It could all stay on your own internal networks. Cool. Uh, someone else asked, how are we different from Cyborg? Or how is sure. this different from Cyborg? 
Um, so there's a, a whole bunch of things that are different from, from TensorBoard, um, and I'll highlight just a couple. So one is beyond just the, the kind of metrics that you would normally see in TensorBoard, we're actually capturing system level metrics as well behind the scenes. So you can see how much CPU or memory um, that you're using. We're also capturing a bunch of metadata about the code and the environment that you ran in. So for instance, you know, I showed the actual kind of source code here, but um, alongside any run, you can have arbitrary artifacts. Another example of some code that we track is requirements.txt, which is showing me exactly what Python libraries I had inside of this Python environment when this ran. So we have a number of features really around reproducibility that you wouldn't find in something like TensorBoard. And then when we really start to shine is after you've done a whole bunch of experiments. So we've heard from um, the majority of our customers that when using TensorBoard, if they have more than a few handfuls of experiments that they're trying to compare, that it tends to get really laggy and become difficult to use. I um, mean, we tried to make our interfaces really snappy when you have even thousands, uh, thousands of experiments. And we've really made it so that you can collaborate with other people on your team, whereas TensorBoard is really just for an individual practitioner generally. The last thing I'd add is if folks really like TensorBoard, you can use it with weights and biases and we'll actually run TensorBoard for you. And you would see that as a tab inside of an individual run here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, this is a couple more questions. Uh, so. Someone asked, can I push the runs I do locally to weights and biases? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so right now there's no um, easy sync interface, uh, but from our, our CLI itself, there is a, a WNB sync command. Um, so you can always sync a local directory back up to our cloud or to another instance of local. In long term for our local offering, um, we envision having a way to uh, just programmatically with a button inside of local say, maybe move this to the, to the cloud version or vice versa. Um, so that's something that we, we hope to come down the road. Thanks. Uh, someone asked, does this not expose your IP to the outside world by releasing the Docker container? No, so the Docker container will just listen on um, the IP address of the host that you're running the Docker container on. Um, so, you know, most of our customers would, instead of say, go to localhost, they'd create their own DNS that would point to um, that, that host. But if that host were on a private network that wasn't exposed to the internet, then that IP address would, would only be known to that network. Cool. Uh, and then this one last question, how does the callback change for PyTorch? Uh, maybe we can share the code for that and I'll answer that in the Slack. Yeah, I just uh, say, oh, you know, check out our, our um, documentation here. And there are examples for, for PyTorch, or especially if you're using Lightning or Ignite, there's some nice callback examples that look a lot like that, that Keras callback. Thanks. Uh, so uh, the person who asked a question about uh, the IP clarified that by IP he meant intellectual property. Oh, I see. So, um, yeah, I mean, all the, the whole point of local is to really isolate all of the data to be fully in your control. So no data would leak beyond your networks um, or, or infrastructure. Cool. Those are all the questions we have. Thank you, Chris, for stopping by. You bet. Thanks, guys. Looking forward to the talks.